What is going on, everybody? This is so fun. Um, we thought we'd do a live stream today for uh, a little celebration. One is that we hit 500,000 subscribers on YouTube today, which is wild. I still can't believe people are interested in buying boring businesses. Uh, so it's pretty crazy to see that. And then I also have TikTok over here because we are about to hit a million subscribers on TikTok. So apparently there's a bunch of humans who are into car washes and laundromats, you psychopaths. So I got Samuel over here who is feeding me questions that you guys send. And, uh, and I got Joe making sure that I actually know how to live stream because that's like not part of my equation. So let me just start off by saying first, um, before we get into all of your questions, um, dude, I think it's really cool that humans would choose to spend a Saturday during the middle of the day learning about buying businesses and making money that makes you guys different than 99.9% .9 of the population. So like first is just like a little, like one of those, you know? Um, and then second is we're going to answer your questions, get kind of technical if you want to, get personal if you want to, unless you guys want feet pics, at which point we're not going to we're not going to be sending feet pics. Nobody really needs that. Um, but Samuel, what do you think one of the first questions is that we want to do? Uh, and who's it from? From Michael. Why, why buy, uh, building over buying? Why building over buying? Oh, gosh. Okay. Buying over building. Got it. Um, so I don't think it's if then, but here's my thought. I like to buy my profits day one. And the reason is because most startups are incredible at one thing. They're incredible at stealing your weekend and giving you a hope and dream that eventually you'll make money. And I don't know about you, but when you start a startup, there's two different reasons you do. One is because you cannot help but do the thing that is part of the startup, aka I'm an artist. I want to create my art no matter what, even if nobody pays me. If that's the case, you should do a startup. If you're starting your startup because you're like, I hate my job, I need to make more money, then why would you spend money with just the hope of making money one day. I never thought that was a good trade-off. So I like to buy businesses that are profitable day one, as opposed to have a startup where I have to pay to potentially become profitable one day. I never loved that idea. And so in that vein, I think the cool part about buying businesses is you can start really small. Since you guys are homies on here, let's say you only have like a couple thousand bucks, right? You don't have very much money you want to start. Well, one of my favorite things to buy is newsletters. You could go to a site like Deuce, which is D-U-U-C-E, and on it, there's a list of newsletters and you can negotiate with them, but there's plenty that are on there for a couple hundred bucks, a couple thousand bucks. And you can take that newsletter, buy it with already profits inherent in it, and then build on top of it. So it's not why buy, not build, but first buy, then build. Michael, I hope that answers your question. What do you got next, Samuel? All right, what's boring business? boring. Um, what's going on? Hey, Anna. Hey, Michael. Hey, Scott. Um, a boring business for somebody in their 20s. Two things. Let me tell you this. First of all, let's talk about my what I call gateway drug businesses, which basically means businesses that um, teach you how to do things like read a p &L, uh, set up your bookkeeping, um, do designs, all of the basics of business. So, that type of business, uh, gateway drug businesses, is, are things like vending machines. We're going to do a whole series on how to start a vending machine business on Instagram. If you're a pro and you have hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, I probably wouldn't start with vending machines. But if you're new to the business, you can get into it with a couple hundred uh, dollar machine used on something like Craigslist or eBay or vendingmachines.com. You can rent a site from somebody for 10 bucks a month or a percentage of your profits, or you can negotiate where you just get to put a machine somewhere. And then a couple hundred bucks in um, in goodies that you're going to put inside of the vending machines. It's a super easy gateway drug to making profits with a business. And so I like uh, businesses like that. So I might do a vending machine business. I might do a newsletter business. I might do a business that has zero dollars um, to acquire because you use seller financing, two of my favorite words, which means the seller pays you to buy the business through the future profits of the business. Let's break it down real quick. Let's say a business does $100,000 in profit. That would mean the business is probably worth 200 to 300,000 or two to three X, right? If I wanted to buy that business, but I wasn't sitting on 200 to $300,000, I might go to the seller and go, hey, Tom, incredible business. You're 67. You know, you're looking to retire. Nobody uh, in your business is going to take it over. What if I buy your business? I can't afford to buy it right now in cash, but I will pay you over the course of 
five years, uh, a percentage of the profits every single year until I pay back the full $300,000 that I said I was going to. And so I love buying businesses that way. Uh, what else we got? All right. From May G, it's a consulting business. How do you start it? A consulting business and how do you start it? What's going on, DJ? What's going on, Anna? We got another one. Um, how do you start a consulting business? Uh, Dude, I don't know. I don't run a consulting business. Um, if you guys follow me online, here's the stuff that I'm really good at. I am good at helping people invest, helping people buy businesses. I'm good at unfair advantages. Um, what I try to not do is talk about stuff that I don't know anything about. Um, I probably wouldn't do a consulting business for my first business because consulting businesses are really hard to sell. And when I think about business creation. I'm always starting with the end in mind. So uh, Samuel and I were actually talking, Samuel's my, my videographer. And I was like, uh, he was like, I would never start a photography business in my name. Because he was telling me that he had a friend who started it like Cody Sanchez photography. And he was like, it was so hard to sell that business because, um, oh, are you actually up there? Is the camera actually up there? Oh, I've been looking down here the whole time. I'm like, why am I looking down here? But it's actually up here. So the reason uh, why I wouldn't start a photography business uh, and put it in my name is then who's going to buy Cody Sanchez photography? Where if instead you name it, I don't know, uh, endless photography or something like that, it's easier to sell. So consulting businesses have something called key man risk, which means that you or you on the internet, wherever the camera is in this damn facility, um, you are the business. There isn't a business without you. And so you have to be really careful when you build businesses that you're creating a business and not a job. What else we got? All right. Trucking company. Why or why not? Why or why not a trucking company? Um, so we wrote an entire article, actually. I don't know, Joe, if we can figure out how to drop a link in here. But if not, go to contrarianthinking.co. It's free search trucking. And in there, you'll find a step-by-step -step article on how to buy a trucking company, how to start a trucking company. And then I always use case studies because I think they're easier to understand. Like this guy made $65,000 a month by starting a trucking company. And so um, we have an exact breakdown of that. I'm not going to tell you to do it or not do it. What I would tell you is there's going to be a lot of these companies for sale, I think, in the coming year. One, because um, basically people bought trucks at really expensive rates over the last couple of years. Everybody out there knows how expensive you guys bought cars maybe too, like super expensive, right? Um, so I think they're, they overpaid for it. The price has come down. Uh, I also think this is an interesting business in a way because last mile delivery, aka all those boxes we all get from Amazon, uh, create incredible amount of need for trucking. And so I have a couple of friends that own trucking distribution routes for Amazon, which basically means, let's say in my neighborhood, they might own this exact neighborhood and deliver all the goods to this location. They make millions of dollars a year. Ah, look how fancy we are. Um, so you can basically see if you're on YouTube, you can see a breakdown of the, ac uh, the actual article. Uh, cool question. What else we got? Um, gas stations. Um, let's see. So I don't like gas stations. Gas stations in general, and the reasons why I don't like them are one, you have a ton of inventory. AK, if you've gone into a gas station, how many items are in there? Thousands. You have to have a really tight supply on logistics and uh, when to buy and sell based on demand. There's lots of software to do all of that, but it's complex. Two, safety. Gas stations go through a lot of safety issues. I don't really like the idea of getting held up, of having issues with like homeless that are located nearby. Not really into any of that. Um, three, do you guys know how much money uh, people make on every gallon of gas that you buy? You might be like, God, these gas stations suck. Gas is $7 a gallon. They make pennies. They make literal sense on every gallon. It's wild, not good. And so because of that, I'm really thoughtful on gas stations because the only way they make money is inside the store. And then what I call the satellite revenue uh, streams, which are things like little car washes, the air fillers that are in it, um, tune-ups or whatever. So gas stations are a no for me, although plenty of people make a lot of money on there. You just have to be a good operator and it's a complex-ish business. 
Oh. There's a TikTok saying the sound's so bad. Sorry, guys. Um, okay. Well, I TikTok, what's up? I suck. We'll do a, a TikTok live that's better for you guys in particular. If you really wanted to watch this, go to YouTube because apparently it's better anyways. And also like, uh, you know, fuck the Chinese government. Okay. Uh, bye, TikTok. So um, YouTube, what else we got, Samuel? All right. For seller financing, how much do you pay the seller as a percentage of your profit? How much you pay a seller as a percentage of your profits? Well, that's not really how it works. How it works is what is the value of the business? So like I said, if you use two to three X, the profit, or you could use EBITDA more complex, you can Google it if you don't know the difference. But let's say you just keep it simple, the profit of the business, then basically you can do structuring however you want. So if a business is making hundred K profit, $300,000 in, um, valuation is probably what the business is worth, something like that. So a percentage would basically just mean, can you get the seller to structure it out over 10 years? Can you get them to structure it out over only three? Um, it's really up to you. What else we got? What's a good business to start in AI? I don't know. Um, I think unless you are a little mini genius or a coder over there with an unfair advantage, AI is a lot of hype and probably not your best use case. I like boring businesses that I have a high likelihood of being able to win at because when was the last time you had a landscaping company that was an incredible performer or super competitive? Um, it just doesn't happen. And so I would rather compete with that than compete with OpenAI that has billions of dollars in backing and is going to crush a lot of these little guys. Also, be careful this one thing. Like, here's how I can tell you if somebody's not a real operator, not a real startup uh, founder, not a real investor, and maybe a grifter. They were in NFTs. They were in blockchain. They were in Bitcoin. They were in AI. Like, don't just like follow the crowd into the next big thing. There's something called the Lindy effect, which basically means the longer something's been in existence, the more likely it is to continue to be in existence. So as opposed to chasing the new hot trend, maybe do the exact opposite. What else? How do you feel about parking companies? Parking companies. Um, well, we actually got... We're good. We did an article on this too. Um, I don't know if Samuel's like teeing me up or you guys basically are, are on top of it. Um, we did an entire article. If you go to contrarianthinking.co and you go to and you search parking, you can see um, that we did an article breakdown step by step. And I'm looking at the article right now. Yeah, this is actually cool. Um, of how to buy a parking garage, how to buy a parking lot, and then even buying individual parking spots, which is wild. And you can only do in big cities. I love this model. Here's the thing I want you guys to keep remembering. It's always about what you bought the business for. So how much did you buy the parking spot for? And is that a real representation of the value? That's what's important. Um, by the way, what's up, Peppa, Fabio, that one guy, Umet, Roland, cool. Some construction owners in here. Sweet. Um, oh, this is rad. You guys are giving money. Well, we're going to give away some cash this week too. So I'll give it all back to you guys if anybody donates. That's cool. Let's let's throw out uh let's throw out so Carter's question is trunking company for sale that's non-CDL, but main contract is newspaper. Two years left on contract, about 30% net profit. Carter, not enough to break down this deal. So what you need to know to break down a deal is a couple things. If you were like, Cody, tell me if I should buy this business, yes or no. I'd need to know quite a few things, but broadly, I'd need to know what's the profit of the business, What's the revenue of the business? How long has the business been in effect? What is the main driver of the business's expenses that could that could mean that it increases, aka this point you put in there, Carter, is important, like lease. Oh my gosh, there's only six months left and then they're going to double it. Um, I'd want to see historical financials so that I can verify that profit and the revenue. And then I'd want to know the valuation of the business. What do they want? The last thing is you probably have to tell me are you going to have to hire an operator? So you need to have enough profit in there to do it, or are you going to run the business? And then you'd need to know how much money do I need to make to make this worth it? So that's what I would think about Carter in doing that. Another little like cool hack is we have a, we have a, I hate the word mastermind. We got to like come up with a new word for that, Samuel, but 
we have a mastermind or a group of humans who are all trying to buy small businesses. And I would say get into some group like that if you're serious about business buying, because what happens is it's all about reps. You know, like the first time you throw a baseball, you look kind of stupid and probably like the 10th or 15th time you do too. And then you kind of like get used to the process, right? You get used to the flick of the wrist, you get used to the wind up. And the same thing's true for doing deals. It's not hard. You just need a lot of reps. And a fast way to get good at reps is to do them consistently and watch other people do them too. What do you think the next one is, Samuel? I got a good one here. It's a 14 year old aspiring entrepreneur. What should they start learning now so they could be ready in the future? Um, no, that's cool. Looks like we're at more subscribers. How fun YouTube. Um, what should they start learning now? Well, I'm biased. If, if I said something like, uh, you know, painting and probably weird on this channel. So take it with a grain of salt. But if you're 14, there's one thing you should do right now. One thing and one thing only shouldn't be trying to make more money immediately today. You shouldn't be trying to do some fake get rich quick scheme. Forget drop shipping on Amazon. Forget Shopify store creation. Forget all these little hacky things that people on here say. You need to obsess about learning. I wish that I had gotten crazy about business earlier. I probably didn't really get the business itch until I was a year or two in finance. So you're already ahead of the game. I was never watching stuff like this on YouTube. I was a little idiot. And so I would say um, three skills that I wish I learned earlier. One is deal making or negotiating. So just how do you get what you want out of a situation? Different than sales. Sales is how do I communicate a tactic in order to get a sale? Deal making and negotiation can be used for everything from getting your parents to allow you to do something to getting a sale to closing a deal. Second thing would be finance. This is super boring, but it doesn't have to take that long. Learn terms for how to structure deals, learn how to read a PL, learn sort of that boring stuff. Think about it like the foundation basically for um, money, for getting rich, for lack of a better term. And then the third is you want to get around a bunch of other people who are way more successful than you. So as much as you can, go bother a bunch of people who are a couple rungs off the ladder than you. Uh, that's what I would do if I was 14. What do you think next, Samuel? What do you think the highest profit cash flowing business? Mm, I think that's a bad question. All right. No, no, no. It's okay. It's good that you used it because people ask this question all the time. Let me tell you why that's a bad question. I, I teach something called the unfair advantage in business buying. My highest ROI business is different than your highest ROI business. If I gave Samuel this business right now, like my, let's say my $50 million portfolio of boring businesses, I'm sure Samuel would be pretty happy. Um, but it's probably not going to be as lucrative for Samuel as it is for me. Why? Because I've done this for so long. I'm really good at building portfolios. I've been in private equity for a long time. What would Samuel's unfair advantage business be? It would probably be something in the creative sphere. He would probably be better off owning and amalgamating a bunch of video production uh, businesses. He might even be better off owning a business that is an agency overall. So what you want to do is there's four steps to buying businesses. The first step is learning. You just have to figure out what the opportunity is and uh, how to buy a business. Within that, you have to understand your skill sets because you want to leverage those. Second step is learning how to get cash, right? How do I get money even if I don't have it to make the business acquisition? Third step is how do I find a business? Cody, tell me they're all over the place. What are the processes? And then the fourth step is what do I do once I got this business? How do I cash flow on it and run it? And so um, you are in the first stage and what you should be learning is how to buy a business and how to buy a business that is an unfair advantage business for you. Then you can go to the other four. Um, What's up? Hey, Carlos. What's up, Amy, Mel, Will, Nick? Um, let's see. We got a couple from um, Beres asked, what do you think about Turo? Does it make sense in 2023 and can it be profitable? I'm split on this. So we also have an article, contrarianthinking.co, search Turo um, or search uh, Rideshare. In there, there's a step-by-step -step breakdown of how to make money on Turo. Um, and also an example of a guy that did it a few times, and then we've played this game before. 
in the right market, you can make money on Turo. I think that for a while there, it got super overinflated, too many cars available. And then we're coming into a recession, guys. So during a recession, you're going to have less people traveling from a business perspective. They're going to shut down travel uh, because that's the first thing that goes is corporate ca credit cards. Um, they're also probably going to do not as many luxury rentals, which is where you make the real margin on Turo. So I'd be thoughtful, Barras, before you did that. Um, Okay, let's answer Jonathan's question. What's going on, moneymaker? I like it. Um, what about video podcast studio with high quality green screen virtual sets? Each podcaster has a unique set with a push of a button. This exists. Um, before you go and create a, you know, a podcast studio, there's one really easy thing you could do. Um, one, I would go see if there's any for sale that lets you actually go and look behind the curtain of a bunch of these businesses, which is cool. So just go to Biz by Sell, Go to um, LoopNet, uh, Google search podcast production businesses for sale or podcast studios for sale. Reach out to them, see what the business makes. Now that I've done this for as long as I have, I can kind of assume that I'll know the margins or like how profitable a business is pretty much across the board, um, at least, you know, to some degree. Um, but in the beginning, that's like the muscle that you're going to rep. Uh, the second thing that you should do is reach out to some owners in a non-competitive market and say like, hey, man, I'm thinking of opening one of these in Phoenix, Arizona. I love what you guys have done. Um it, you know, would you be open to talking to me? I'll, I'll buy you lunch. I'll give you 500 bucks. You know, I just want to pick your brain on if this is a terrible an idea, if I should open one of these or not, and, and the pitfalls. What you'll be surprised by is, by, is running businesses and building businesses can be so miserable and lonely that people will actually talk to you about it. And you might be surprised by how much. What do you think next, Samuel? Uh, what is a good book to learn business lingo? Good book to learn business lingo. Oh yeah, toss it. Look at you. Um, this isn't necessarily business lingo exactly, but Agile m and uh, not my book, I'm not getting paid for this or anything, but um, this is really good for learning um, how to buy businesses with some like 21st century tech tint. So I actually really like this book. Um, honestly, when it comes to learning finance overall and finance terms, I don't think there's great books that aren't going to bore you to absolute death. Let me look in my library here. Um, obviously, there's the old school like Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That'll teach you a 101 version. I also like, but this is this is like a little bit more in, in detail. There's... Um, there's a couple of books on VC that I think are really, uh, really interesting, which is like, um, there's, uh, what is that called? Uh, the Venture Game. Uh, that's an interesting book. There's also, I think, a lot of understanding finance is understanding statistics. There's a book called Naked, St Naked Statistics that's pretty cool. If you want to learn um, deal making through the lens of a storyteller and a billionaire, Sam Zell's uh, Am I Being Too Subtle is really good, too. Um, I think those are the ones that I would give, give you, but you're probably better off, honestly, really individually searching for terms after you listen and go binge, uh, read all the content on contrarian thinking. A lot of these finance books are too high level or they're about the stock market, which I don't really think is the right game for you. Um, what else, Samuel? How do you feel about equipment rental businesses? Oh, I love them. So I have a friend that, um, I have a friend that is not on the internet. You couldn't find him anywhere. He's so funny. His his name is Robert and I won't say his whole name, but he has this like thick Texas drawl and he always likes to kind of pretend like he's, he's not that smart. You know, he'll say something like, well, I'm just a poor boy from the country. So what do I really know? Oh my God, I can't do accents. But like theoretically imagine that sounded like a Texan. Um, and what's fascinating is uh, the sentence that follows that will be like, then he'll be like, however, the cap rate on this is pretty out of whack with industry standard. And I imagine that if you were actually going to do this cash on cash return, so he's a genius. And what he basically realized is in the market that I used to live in, Phoenix, Arizona, there was so much construction that equipment rental demands were huge. So he, before he started the business, he arbitraged it. He just rented other people's equipment 
when he already had clients for a tiny bit of a premium. So he went out to the market and was like, hey, do you guys need some rental equipment? Okay, great. If I charge you X, will you buy it? Great. Sign on the dotted line. Then went back, rented from the other person, proved his business concept, then built the business. Um, so I do like those businesses in the right markets. Make sure that if you buy that business too, pay attention because like the last two years have been wild for construction. So you don't want to buy a business at the height. You might want to wait a couple months and see if the price comes down a little bit as construction stops. Um, by the way, thanks a million restaurant tips for the congrats on 500K. Super fun. I think we're all going to get rich in here and then we're going to see less Starbucks on the street corners, which is cool. Okay. What else do you think, Samuel? All right. We have someone wants to know about restaurants. No. <laughs> I mean, I hate restaurant businesses. Let me tell you why. One, they have a 90% failure rate. Uh, this is standardized across all businesses, meaning like they are 90% more likely to fail than the aggregate of small businesses, which is a crazy statistic. They uh, have a lot of issues, like they have really high build-out costs. It's expensive to, to start them. They uh, have a lot of certifications and regulations and reoccurring costs. Then uh, you have to have a bunch of inventory that basically becomes worthless if you don't sell it. You know, e-commerce or info products, I can keep selling my, my stuff. No problem. You, if you own a restaurant, you got a bunch of lettuce that went bad. It's bad. You can't do anything with it. And so that's a sunk cost. I think you have to be a really good operator in order to run a restaurant. Well, when I buy businesses or invest in businesses, I like to do them where it's like, I don't have to be the best operator. I have to be like pretty good, but I don't have to be the best in order to make a lot of cash. What else do you think, Samuel? All right. Uh, if someone wants to buy an e-com business, what is how do they identify the right e-com business? It's a good question. Um, I think that, so we have something called, so I teach something called the 10 steps to um, acquisitions. And um, you can actually, there should be quite a few articles on our website, contrarianthinking.co, if you want to talk about business buying. We also have a free newsletter. It's ugly right now. We're doing a website redesign, so just like bear with me on it, but the information's really incredible at unconventionalacquisitions.com. Um, and there's a free newsletter on there that you should get on about biz buying. But, um, and it's going to have a glow up uh, in a week or two, and I think it'd be really cool. But um, it's a hard question to answer because the real answer is that you have to understand acquisition across the board, no matter what type of business you're going to buy. So I guess I'd ask the question back to you, do you know how to buy a business? That's step one. Let's say you know how to buy a business. Cool. Then the second question would be, do you know how to buy an e-com business? And as long as you have step one, we can move on to step two, um, because then there's some spe sector specifics. But usually people don't even know step one. Some of the differences about e-com businesses are, for instance, if you followed like the last two years, there were all these things called uh, e-commerce roll-ups, which bas basically meant these groups of people with some cash uh, did an aggregation stat strategy. So they pull together a bunch of e-com businesses and they say, hey, this weird thing happens where if I have an e-com business that costs, that does $100,000 in profit, it's worth, let's say, $200,000. But if I have an e-com business that's worth a million dollars in profit, it, sold, it sells for 5X. So it sells for 5 million. So if I just go and I buy 10 $100,000 profit e-com businesses, I mash them together, they're not worth a million dollars. Now they're worth $5 million, right? Or they're not worth two or $3 million. They're worth $5 million. And so, um, so a bunch of companies did this. But what happens is usually the integration of multiple businesses is tough. So they weren't worth a ton. So what I would say is e-com has come off of a really hot streak. Be really thoughtful in the type of businesses that you buy. And I don't like uh, fulfilled by Amazon businesses to buy. Uh, what else do you think? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, would you like to buy a biz or hold on to your cash right now? Would you like to buy a biz or hold on to your cash right now in an economic in in this economic environment? Um, I'm buying. I'm a, I'm a net buyer right now. Uh, I'm a seller of real estate to some degree, and I'm buying businesses because there's so many of them. Actually, you guys, we're filming this today, aren't we? We're filming um, 
a whole thing on how to buy a business. So make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel. I'm sure you guys are if you're here. Um, but we're going to build a, we're going to record a step-by-step -step on how to buy businesses uh, because I think this next year or two is going to be really good for buying businesses. But the beautiful part is there's so much demand. There's something like 11 million small businesses for sale right now in the US um, that it doesn't matter so much what the macro environment is as long as you do a, do a good deal. So do a good deal and then it doesn't really matter. You don't have to, it's not like um, the stock market where you buy a stock and you need to know you bought at a good moment so that the market can go up. When you buy a business, if I buy a business right now for $10,000 and the business makes $10,000 a year, well, I only have to wait one year for the business to return me my entire $10,000. Then if I hold it for 10 more years and the business doesn't even grow, well, I've 10 x to my cash, right? And so I don't really care. Do I care if the market went up, down, sideways, otherwise? No, as long as I make sure the business is going to continue or grow, I'm good to go because I'm cash flowing in the meantime. That's the beauty. Market timing is really hard. When you buy a business, you don't have to market time as long as you make sure you do a good deal. Um, what else do you think? Hey, Marcus. Hi, Josh. Um, Oh, some of you guys are asking, how do you feel about varying types of business? If that's one of your questions, like junk removal, party business, um, what else? Like a bunch of motels, da, da, da. Um, I have a, an article on contrarianthinking.co that is 150 small businesses I like to buy. I think we've done probably 30 or 40 of them as deep dives, but then there's another 110 or whatever that uh, are listed. So that might answer a bunch of those one-off questions for y'all and you could dig in. Um, all right. How much longer are we doing this for? Okay. I'm going to do five more minutes uh, and then, uh, you know, I'm going to let Samuel have a Saturday. I feel like he might want to like hang out with his new fiance or my dog, which is around here somewhere. Um, give me another question. What do you think? How do you feel about starting an Airbnb business? Oh God, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't start an Airbnb business right now. Don't buy one either. Um, <laughs> I hope he's not listening because I really like him, but I have this friend who I joke and I say, just tell me when you're putting a ton of money into a sector, because the second you do that, I'm going to short it. I'm just going to, I'm going to go the opposite direction of whatever thing that you are jumping into. Cause he was like super big into stocks, bam, super big into crypto, bam, Super big into Airbnb. I think we know where it's going. So Airbnb during a recessionary period is not going to do very well. It's never going to be like it was in, during coronavirus and, and COVID, where following that Airbnb just skyrocketed because people needed to get out of the house and they were tired of all these crazy regulations. So I'm really thoughtful on Airbnb right now. Um, okay. What else do we got? And, and who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. This is my two cents. Fabio, what did I just say? I said, buy, then build. What are we doing here? Buy businesses. I think you guys are crazy for not learning how to do acquisitions. One, a pharmacy, like, could you imagine what has more regulation than the government mandating medicine? Also, how are you going to compete with like CVS and Walgreens and all these monstrosities? Um, that's going to be super hard. Uh, also, I think from a perspective of like, ROI and liability, like you're going to have a lot of liability. You're going to have issues with people stealing your underlying drugs and like, don't start, buy, and then you can buy and then build on, on top of it. Okay. Fabio, that's what's up. Uh, we got time for like one or two more questions. All right. We had a few of these. What is the best LinkedIn side business you could start if you already work in 95? Um, I'm going to do this thing. Next time we go live, I'm going to take all the questions. And if the word says start in it, I'm going to delete them. I'm going to delete every single question uh, because, and I'm definitely going to do it for all the side hustles. Can somebody tell me in the comments, what do I think about side hustles? Does anybody know? I just want to see like how many of you guys, like, what do you think? Tell me what you think about side hustles, what I think about side hustles. Do I like side hustles? Yes. No. Maybe so. Tell me about it. I don't see any comments. I just want to see if you guys are listening to this. All right. Nobody's telling me. Can you see them? Is anybody writing if I like side hustles or not? Here's the answer. I don't like side hustles. 
I think side hustles are a waste of your time. I think side hustles typically do not make money. Less than 0.4% of businesses started ever make more than a million dollars. Why wouldn't you de-risk immediately by learning how to buy these businesses instead of start them? How many FIDOs are you guys going to walk in order to make enough money to quit the nine to five you don't like? You're going to have to walk I mean, 101 Dalmatians ain't enough. And so I don't like these side hustles that are like the toe in the water. If you're going to do something, we have a video on YouTube called, ooh, Joe, maybe you can place it in there. It's like, I'm, I created a $4.1 million business in 10 minutes or something. And basically what I did is I said, listen, I would buy this business and said, but if I was going to start a power washing business, this is what I do. And in order to start this business and then get it to 4.1 million and then really get it over 10 million to sell it, here's how I'd break it down. Take that video, study it, and then take whatever idea that's in your little heart's content that you want to side hustle and exchange the word power washing for something else and do the exact same thing. But I'd really like to open your brains a little bit and, and you know, feel free to tell me to pound sand, but I really like you to consider the fact that you're thinking too small. That's the entire purpose of this channel. What if this sentence is true? And I don't, you know, it doesn't serve me one way or the other if you do this or not. So totally up to you. But what if this sentence is true? That you could buy a business that would completely replace your nine to five income or that would give you six figures or even seven figures in income without using much of your own capital, if any of it. What if that statement is true? Then would you go start a side hustle walking dogs? Or would you instead try to go one step bigger? I wish, and I think I'm annoying about this because for so long, I just like lived other people's lives. I worked at jobs I didn't like. I made a lot of money for other people instead of myself. I didn't negotiate enough for me. And then I finally realized, wait a second, all these deals I'm doing for these, you know, sorry for the classification, middle-aged white guys and loafers making them tens of millions of dollars. Why couldn't I do this for myself? It's actually not rocket science. And that's why our little slogan is Main Street over Wall Street, because I think more of us should be owners. And I think if you believe that one sentence, or you could open up your mind to believe that one sentence, then your life will never be the same. And you'll be one of the 1% and you won't ever feel scarcity and you'll be able to bring other people along with you. Okay. I think that is one more. Okay. <laughs> Tom, sorry to repeat the question. Who is my most important employee? That's awesome because I'm sure none of them are watching it uh, right now. Here's a t here's an even better response that they'll all hate equally because I think that seems like a good thing to do. Um, if you have one employee that is so important that your business could go sideways, you don't have a business. And so one thing I try to make sure that I do is in every single employee that I have, there's some sort of duplicative nature. So let's say, Samuel, sorry, you're, you're, you're irreplaceable. You're perfect. You're never going anywhere. But let's say that Samuel left me. You guys have seen I'm like pretty much incompetent at uh, manning any of this technology. And so would my business fall apart? Would our YouTube never post another video without Samuel? Well, no because I have a backup videographer, I have a backup agency, we have multiple editors, and I have a head of the business who is in charge of hiring more of them if Samuel leaves. And so that's the same reason why, you know, I like to help my people who work for me invest in different things. Because let's say I make a terrible decision and this business goes under and I can no longer pay for them. I want to make sure they're not destitute. I want to make sure they want to be here, not have to be here. And it's the same for your employees or anybody that works with you. All right. Um, talk about your all-time backfires, Samuel and Joe. <laughs> You're replaceable, bitches. Um, anyway, uh, I appreciate you guys all so much for being here. Um, Joe, actually, can you can they see you now, Joe? You want to say I'm hi? on screen? Uh, I was Whoa. just gonna say, if we're replaceable, I'll end the stream right now. I'm not <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, Joe said, he, Joe and I were laughing today because I was like, Joe, you hold the keys to the castle. I don't think anybody else at this company knows how to stream, so we this better figure true. this out. That's my competitive I, advantage. That's, yeah, it's one of your many. Um, also, one other thing I will say that I think is kind of cool about this team is we, as you can see, are we're like kind of finance pros. Like we're investment pros. I mean, we're on the internet doing cool video because I find it super fun and, and interesting and, and it adds a lot of, um, 
like richness to my life. Um, but I hope whoever you're listening to or whoever you're turning into, make sure that they're not just entertainers. How many of those guys, like anybody who sold you an NFT over the last two years, you should go and shin kick, even if you made money, because it was all speculation. You should not follow those people anymore. You know, anybody who is telling you hodl no matter what in Bitcoin with all of your finances, you should stop following them. And I think you should try to follow humans who um, have been an expert somehow at what they're talking about and are willing to do this thing, which hopefully I do. I'll be wrong many times. I've been wrong many times before and I will be in the future with people who um, will say the stuff that they don't know and don't understand. Uh, my husband has this thing he always talks about, which is that he hates when people talk in absolutes like this will happen, that will happen. They get all these clicks on YouTube, right? Like the end is coming. Follow my advice for how to start your Amazon FBA sh drop shipping company next. It's like, no, no, no. You don't know if the end's coming. But what I do hope you guys take away from this is that you all are much smarter probably than the system wants you to be. And you're much more capable and getting a lot of cash and gaining massive wealth actually isn't as hard as people make it out to be. All right, Joe, signing off.